Thank you so much for the uh, kind words and introduction and super thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I have many thoughts about dream and I think the kind of impact um, that both has happened and can happen um, with bringing minds together to solve pressing challenges in genomics uh, in my case. Um, so, uh, so thank you and I look forward to meeting many of you. Um, later today and tomorrow. Um, I should start by saying what my talk is about. Um, this is a photo I took this morning, actually, at an excellent patisserie across the street over in the Bellagio. I recommend you go there. Um, they had um, these sort of cheese danishes and cherry danishes. And um, I had a cheese danish, and it's really good. <laughs> I recommend it. But you may actually want a cheese and a cherry Danish, and they did not have those on offer. Um, and I think that situation is very analogous to something that's happened in computational or systems biology, which is you have people that are, I'll call for today, quantitative biologists, and there's some of you in this room, um, because people who have um, trained and have a background in systems biology often um, are quantitative biologists, I'll see what that means in a minute, um, versus more computational biologists who are, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that as well. So there are these, I think, two communities, and I'm gonna give a, a very simple, but I'll work through it example today of why it's important for these two communities to talk to each other, and why I think DREAM is actually a very in, interesting and useful um, vehicle for, for that to happen. So that's what my talk is about cherry, uh, a cheese and cherry danishes. Um, I'd just like to begin by thanking um, many of the students in my lab, uh, primarily who um, basically like, whose work and ideas more than work led to this project. Um, particular, a lot of what I'll talk about is ideas of uh, my graduate student, Gennady Gorin, who will graduate shortly. He is more of a cheese Danish. Um, I also have cherry danishes in my group and they talk to each other, um, and that's partly what led to this project. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, work of Sina Buishagi, another uh, postdoc of mine, who has um, done uh, some of the computational biology that's relevant today. Um, and uh, that long list of people in my groups, and finally, uh, in my group who've just been in conversations and contributed. And finally, I'll just I'll also thank Nicholas Bray, a uh, former student of mine who has given me interesting ideas and metaphors for this talk. Um, but just a word about my role in this project to make very clear. Um, again, if you walk across the street, you'll find an excellent restaurant called Spagel um, by Wolfgang Puck. Um, you can buy a $15 avocado toast there. Um, and I think that, uh, well, well, when I saw this restaurant, it struck me that this is analogous uh, a little bit to when you have a person like me uh, presenting a keynote talk uh, it's like you go to an expensive restaurant. I'm going to sell, also sell you very expensive avocado toast at the end of the day. Um, and uh, I'm like Wolfgang Puck, you know, my contribution, uh, basically I'm in the kitchen watching everybody else cook. I don't think Wolfgang Puck, uh, uh, you know, he founded this restaurant first in 1982. He's not actually cooking the food. Um, so just to make that clear. Okay, so to start on the content of the, of the presentation, I'd like to mention briefly um, uh, uh, a drug called Kineret. Uh, you may or may not have heard of it. Um, it, it, it came, it's an Amgen drug and it was uh, approved for COVID-19 um, during the pandemic. Um, I think in the European uh, Union at first. Um, well, what is this drug? Uh, it acts as a sort of decoy receptor uh, a decoy um, uh, key, if you will, for the interleukin receptor. Um, as you may know, like one of the ways people got very sick during COVID was with uh, sort of interleukin storms. And this, um, this drug can help prevent those. Uh, this is a simple cartoon that's from the Amgen website, just to, to show you what it is. Um, uh, you know, usually interleukin-1 binds into the interleukin receptor and kineret, it's sort of like a decoy interleukin-1. It goes instead, and then it just stops the whole cascade. So that's why it's a useful drug, and that's why it was repurposed for COVID. 
But why am I telling you about this? Well, many years ago, um, I was a professor at Berkeley. This was about, I don't know, like 15 years ago. Um, uh, we had a seminar actually at, uh, at Berkeley by uh, uh, a scientist, he's at Amgen, Gilles Jacara, um, and he was um, basically doing systems biology on, on this drug. He was actually studying this particular chemical reaction network um, where, uh, you know, um, yeah, Ken Kinneret is the antagonist that's labeled A, um, there's the receptor, it's labeled R, and the question was here, well, you know, in addition to a decoy for interleukin-1, you can also have a decoy for the receptor. That's called a trap. Um, but if you have a trap, it can also actually uh, capture some of the interleukin-1, and it can also capture some of the decoy. Um, and so the, there's a sort of system. It's a network. You know, it's a gene regulatory network. Um, uh, it's a synthetic gene regulatory network. And he was studying in, in sort of differential equations um, that describe the dynamics to understand what are the parameters for like this kind of drug trap, antagonist trap combination to work. And um, this led to a paper, um, which I'm, I wasn't involved in, but uh, it, one of my former students, Anne Shu, uh, who worked with me and uh, another colleague, Bernd Sternfels was involved. And uh, well, they studied sort of the algebra of this um, uh, system of differential equations um, I won't say anything about it. It's it's a, it's interesting math, uh, but it's um, uh, but that's all I'll say about it. And you'll see in a second why I'm mentioning it. Well, the reason I'm bringing it up is that, um, and I I'll just go back here. I haven't exactly explained the system of differential equations, but you can get an idea, right? There's species, and they're going up and down. Um, this this modeling by differential equations in systems biology. It, it has a, a history that goes back to 1950s. Um, there were several scientists. Uh, one of them was uh, Jacques Monod, um, who I, I like to mention him because he's, he had a stint at Caltech where I now work. Um, but he and others proposed uh, using differential equations to model transcriptional dynamics in gene regulatory networks. Um, and um, it, you know, it's, some of these differential equations are, fairly straightforward and mathematicians sometimes scoff at them because they don't, you know, they're not, they're, they're ordinary differential equations. Um, but writing them down was actually a very non-trivial thing because uh, this was around a time when, you know, we were just figuring out uh, the central dogma. And, um, uh, and, and in a sense, these differential equations were a way to write down a mathematical, mathematical model of the central dogma. The central dogma was uh, posited by Francis Crick is that, um, that there's a flow of information that's very important uh, from DNA to RNA to protein, and the information doesn't go in the other direction. Um, so these, these chemical reaction networks were a way to sort of formalize this completely brand new idea. And I think that represented um, excellence in mathematical uh, and computational biology. The, the simplest equation, and, and basically the one they wrote down, I've, I've reproduced their dx by dt is k minus gamma x. Well, here x, you might think, is, is some transcript, some gene. It's being produced at some production rate k, and it's been degraded at some rate gamma. That's the simplest thing you could write down, and that's basically what they wrote down in the 1950s. But there are two issues with this model, and they're going, those issues are central to what I want to talk about today. The first is that these differential equations, they model RNA as a continuous uh, variable, whereas in reality, you either have zero copies of a molecule, uh, one, two, three, it's discrete. So somehow this is an approximation, the kind of thing physicists like to do. But in the molecular biology regime, we are often in a setting where there are very, very few molecules. Um, so the second thing is that there's no stochasticity. Um, this going back to the Kinneret example, you have this system of differential equations for the antagonist and the receptor and so on, but everything is deterministic. If you fix the parameters, uh, you can run the system. Uh, everything is deterministic as to where it's going to go. Whereas in biology, we now know, um, and thank, thanks to its technology developed in the 1970s so called FISH, fluorescent hybridization, where you could start to track molecules. We know that 
the way that cells work is that there's just stochasticity, um, you know, as part of the process. And, and so anyway, that's missing in these differential equation models. Um, so people, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very tight, you know, it's very popular now to talk about single cell this and single cell that, but single cell biology has a long history that predates genomics. Um, and there are many excellent scientists who um, did a lot of careful work to look at individual molecules and study their properties and understand what kind of models are suitable. Um, one of them is my colleague. Uh, this uh, picture on the top left there is from a paper by Michael Elovitz and colleagues uh, from the early 2000s. He's my next door neighbor now. Um, and he um, you, you know, looked at, uh, he measured uh, the, the variance uh, in gene expression for a single gene within cells and between cells, um, basically measuring the stochasticity inherent in transcription, called that intrinsic noise. I don't love the word noise in the paper, but you know it's because it's biological variation. But in a sense, it is noise because it's random and it's you know maybe not serving some particular purpose in the cell. Um, this work continued over several years by many authors. This is in the early 2000s. Um, there's a very popular model called the Bursty model, and I'll get back to that in a minute, which you might learn if, you know, in an introductory systems biology class, but not in a computational biology class. And it's a model for, um, again, how transcription works. And I'll just say that um, all of this work you know, falls into the rubric of quantitative biology or systems biology, and a lot of it is material that's not studied so much by computational biologists or bioinformaticians who just get large data sets and are processing data. But it's interesting work. So let's jump ahead real quick into genomics. Um, I'm just going to show you, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about exactly how this plot was made in a minute, but, um, but it, you all probably have seen talks by now of single cell genomics. So in this picture, we've zoomed forward 20 years. Uh, this is from a recent uh, article by uh, Wolfgang Huber and postdoc of his. Um, every um, dot in one of these plots is a uh, gene in an experiment. You can look at the bottom row, for example. These are very cell lines. And because there are many, many cells and you've measured the expression of the gene in every cell, then you can uh, make a plot of the variance that you're measuring in the gene across cells versus its mean expression. And um, you get plots like this. Um, those pink lines, um, sorry, uh, uh, before I jump ahead, the pink lines are um, y equals x. And if you, in statistics, uh, again, I'll get to this in a second, but the Poisson process will generate counts which have a mean that's equal to the variance. And so uh, what you see is a little bit more than that. Um, Okay, so, so there is variation in the data, um, and that's observed in genomics data. Okay, so, all right. So here's a question, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is when you see this variance, the noise measurements in modern experiments, well, is it technical noise or is it biological noise, uh, the kind of stochasticity that's measured um, in these kinds of experiments? Or is it stochasticity that just arises because the experiment to generate this data is filled with randomness that's technical? You have to sample molecules and you have to sequence random molecules. So which is it? Well, I don't know, that's what I'm gonna talk about. And I'm gonna focus on the cheese and the cherry Danish. Um, on the one hand, I'm gonna show you that computational biologists look at this variability that is evident in experiments and they understand it to be technical in its entirety. And moreover, they, they fit a distribution called the negative binomial distribution because it happens to be a convenient distribution for counts as a way to assess the technical variation and remove it. I will also show you that quantitative biologists or systems biologists likewise have, a, have settled on this negative binomial distribution, but solely because 
the mechanistic stochastic models for transcription yield that distribution. It's actually a strange state of affairs where within, you know, from the island of biology, the island of quantitative systems, computational biology, it seems like it's just one place. But on that other island, there are two groups of scientists that agree that a negative binomial distribution is a useful distribution for modeling the data, but for completely different reasons. And so we'll talk about it. So in order to uh, discuss this in detail, I need to just spend a few minutes, I'll be quick, to explain to you how we collect this data in case you haven't done that much uh, single cell analysis. There are many technologies, but one of them involves um, using emulsions or aqueous droplets in oils as in oil as little tiny laboratories in which you can perform experiments to learn the information you're interested in, which is the abundance of different genes in individual cells. Um, how are these laboratories made? Well, again, there's many technologies. This is just an illustration. Uh, this is from a method called Indrops. If you know single cell, you know there's a company called 10X Genomics. It sells a popular instrument. It uses a slightly different but related approach, which is to use microfluidic channels to flow oil and beads, synthetic beads and cells um, in a, in, together where, in, so as to pinch off little tiny aqueous droplets in which you capture individual cells together with individual beads. Now the beads are sort of like the lab scientist who's now isolated in a little mini uh, compartment that's an isolated, as I said, little biological laboratory. And the bead has essentially uh, parts on it that do things like capture the RNA and help produce the output that's desired. So let me just, it's important for me to show this slide because we'll understand a bit the technical variation that comes about. So the goal is to get what's on the top left. One cell, that's the little squiggle I made there, together with a circle, it's a synthetic bead. Okay, so why are you trying to get that bead in the cell? Well, if you can get one cell and one bead, then the bead is gonna have olig oligos on it, little you know, DNA sequences that will capture the RNA that's in the cell. The cell first of all has to get lysed, it has to get opened up. And so inside that little laboratory, you'll put some reagents, basically soap. It, it breaks apart the cell. And then you're gonna capture the RNAs and you're gonna do a lot of stuff and end up doing DNA sequencing, but you're gonna measure for that individual cell, uh, how much of each RNA or gene or molecule there was. Now, you might have droplets because you're streaming things through microfluidic channels that just don't have a cell but have a bead and you don't care about that. I mean, nothing happens, you don't capture anything. But you could be in a situation that's not so good because you're, swear, you're streaming in cells. So by, by chance, sometimes you get two cells in one bead and that's kind of bad because the way this works is you're going to label the RNA with that bead, but you're gonna label the RNA from the two different cells with the same label. So you'll think that they came from one cell, but really it was two. So you sort of mix two cells into one. Similarly, you might have two beads with one cell, in which case you've split apart the data from one thing. You're, you think you have two cells, but you only have one. So there's all these technical issues. And and it's amazing work, both in the open source community, people who, like, who develop DropSeq and Indrops and other technologies like that, and some commercial uh, work to really optimize this so you can have not too much of these errors and actually produce good data. But they're errors nonetheless. So the output of one of these experiments at a high level, as simple is you put in the cells and you get out a matrix that has cells by genes and it has counts for every gene how many times did it occur in that cell? And one of the key steps in that process is after you've labeled the RNA from the cells, you make what's called a cDNA library and you go and sequence from it. So these counts in this table, they're part of, they were produced by a random process that's not biological, but technical, where you imagine the RNA is in the swimming pool of cDNA and you grab in and sequence a molecule and you populate a one in this table, you sequence some another molecule and it's like grabbing marbles out of a bag. Sometimes you grab more from one kind or the other, that's what's going in this table. Okay? And that's why statisticians 
are concerned with the technical variability that comes out. So I'm sorry for the, this is, was a PowerPoint conversion today. Uh, so that's why the formula is often weird place, but it's a basic fact that a specific distribution called the negative binomial, and I'll say more about it in a second, has the property that the variance is quadratic in the mean. It's like the mean plus some constant times the mean squared, and that, those constant, that constant is a parameter in the distribution. So, you know, if you were to sample marbles out of a bag, you get a variance equal to the mean, which is the pink or purple line. But if you have even some additional technical noise, then you will often get a negative binomial distribution and you will get one of these quadratic relationships. And actually, you can see the quadratic relationship right there. Um, that's actually what the data looks like. So why would the negative binomial make sense in this kind of technical experiment? Well, it turns out that one way to think about uh, the negative binomial distribution is it's like taking a Poisson distribution, but picking the rate for that Poisson distribution randomly from another distribution that's called the gamma distribution. So, you know, um, that could actually make a lot of sense in this setting because um, in, in a Poisson process, um, there's a specific probability when you dip your hand into the bag of picking out a red marble or a green marble or a blue marble or a gene. Um, the Poisson approximates this multinomial sampling. And if you, you can imagine that this slight technical differences when sampling from one cell type versus another cell type, and those differences could lead to different sampling rates. So that in a sense, the aggregate data is obtained by first essentially like picking the rate from randomly and then doing the sampling. So it's a natural choice um, in statistics for modeling essentially sampling processes where you have just a little bit more noise. All right, now this is kind of a disaster. So I'm sorry, I'll get scrambled. You know, it's, um, uh, it, it's uh, uh, exactly like with the cheese Danish and the cherry Danish, right? There's Microsoft and Google and look what they've done to my slides because they don't work together properly. Anyway, um, sorry about that. I'll just tell you an interesting thing. So in 1948, and actually a bit prior to that, statisticians thought about the following question. Let me just go back to this slide because that one looks ugly where you can see these distributions. They said, look, you know, when you sample marbles out of a bag or genes out of a cell, they weren't thinking about that application yet, but same thing. Um, you, you know, you, you're getting variation because the sampling is random. So that's problematic because if you have a marble that's very abundant or a gene that's highly expressed, it'll be more variable than another gene that's less highly expressed because that's just how the math works, works out. And as a result, when you do downstream analysis, that's a problem unless you're cognizant of that problem. Um, you know, for example, there's procedures like you probably used PCA and implicit in that procedure is the assumption that the variance is equal in each gene, but that's not true, okay? And so they came up with methods to do something called normalizing the data, which is to transform all the counts so that in every gene or in every marble, the variance is roughly equal. Okay? So they come up with methods for that. And actually, the first method they came up with is if your data is Poisson or it's sitting on that purple line where the variance equals the mean, then it turns out the kind of optimal thing to do is to take the square root of the counts. So they did that. Um, but Anscombe came up with another formula for when the data is negative binomial. And I'm sorry, it's a mess there, but it's two times the uh, inverse hyperbolic sine of x squared of x plus c over k plus d where these constants come from um, the parameters of the negative binomial. Um, it's a mess, okay? But it's, um, uh, but it's kind of like the right and optimal transformation when your data is negative binomial to fix this problem that you have this relationship that you don't want between the mean and the variance. But the nice thing is that, and Anscombe already realized this a long time ago, is that that particular, that ugly hyperbolic arc sign, you know, I don't even know what that is because I learned, I think it was in the calculus class when I was in high school, 
But who ever like cared? I mean, I didn't care. I've never seen that again uh, since that class. Maybe in special relativity once, but that, it's you know. So it doesn't come up in genomics. But it turns out that that ugly thing, whatever it is, is very well approximated by the logarithm function. All right. And it's actually a logarithm of x plus k over 2, where k is related to that constant in the quadratic of that negative binomial. It turns out that it's called a pseudo count. And you should, like, the more, the, the, the higher slope that quadratic, the faster it goes up, you, you need to adjust that pseudo count if you want the optimal transfer. And it turns out, well, that's why everybody does the logarithm. You've probably logged your data. Everybody logs their data. I mean, that's why, okay? Because, um, well, you're assuming that your data is negative binomial and this is a good transformation. Um, computational biologists nowadays, if you do any kind of genomics, the first thing you do to your data is you log the data. And it doesn't matter if you're doing single cell or bulk RNA-seq or some other genomics experiment or even not a genomics experiment, the first thing you do is log your data and that's where it comes from. Now, there are actually other, uh, you know, there are other ch choices other than logarithm. It turns out in single cell, there's an additional problem that the sampling depth of each cell is not equal. So you need also to do a depth normalization. And the interaction of those two things is actually complicated and has not been studied carefully by statisticians. So there's a lot of different methods and that would be a great dream benchmark. Uh, to figure out which one is best. We just recently wrote a paper where we looked at 526 data sets and we didn't benchmark the methods, but we just measured what they do to the data. And I just wanted to show you um, the, the top plot. Um, that's measuring the coefficient of variation in the variance. Basically, after the transformations, how equal is the variance among genes? I mean, they're trying to make it equal. And the, mess the take home message is that they're all basically very good. It doesn't matter exactly which one you use. Um, square root, which is, so I mean, the first two are the raw, like forget the second column, but raw is uh, you don't do anything to the data. So there's a lot of variability in the variance, but even taking square root or log, you know, the, everything becomes equal. Log is better than square root because the data is not Poisson. It's more um, negative by number. All right. But when you do this procedure, uh, going back to the previous question, you know, you might wonder, you know, have you thrown the biological baby out with the, um, uh, with the technical bathwater, so to speak? So, you know, you, the method works. It gets rid of this variance, but maybe there was biology in that variance. We decided to take a look, and it's actually not, it's an interesting experiment we did, computational experiment. We took different cell types. We actually took five cell types from the data set. We've done this with different data sets and in different ways. Um, but if you take a collection of cell types, you can average within a cell type the gene expression across many, many cells, in which case you can presume that you've essentially averaged out all the technical variation. And then when you look between cell types, that's biological because the averaging within cell type across many, many cells has averaged out the biological, unless there's technical variation between cell types, which is unlikely. Um, in, in the data sets we're looking at. Uh, this, I'll show you in a minute, we looked at brain data um, where it's very, yeah, we had reasons to think there wasn't much technical variance between cell types. And then we asked, well, what's the variation between cell types? That's a lower bound for biological variability. And we looked at how much variance is removed by the normalization procedure. And, you know, you should hopefully not remove more variance um, then the biological lower bound, okay? Because if you did that, then you, um, you've removed some advance. And in fact, it uh, turns out that, and this, this is for the log function, but all of the normalization procedures are throwing out the biological baby with the bathwater. It turns out that this lower bound on biological variance um, is, ex you know, uh, is exceeded. Um, the amount of variance that's being removed is, um, is more than, than biological variance exists. Okay, so that led us to a question, what can you do about this? And that brings me to the other half. So I've talked about the right-hand side, how you get that negative binomial with the technical noise. But now we switch to the other side, which is, well, 
how do the systems biologists uh, think about this variance? And maybe we can actually estimate what the actual biological variance is. So to do that, I need to tell you like, what are the models that the systems biologists use for mechanistic models for transcription that lead them to this negative binomial? And this is standard material in systems biology classes, but strangely, almost no computational biologists I've ever worked with or interacted with take those classes. So I'll do very, uh, just bear with me a minute, I'll explain what's going on. So the models they use are um, known as um, chemical master equation models. That's at least the name in chemical engineering. They're like chemical reaction networks, like I showed you in the beginning, but they're stochastic. So, you know, they're not deterministic ordinary differential equations. That's number one. And secondly, they operate on discrete state spaces. So they fix those two problems. So I think this model is called the constitutive model. And I think I can uh, explain it just with my hands, maybe. So imagine a rope with knots on it. And we're going to look at one type of RNA only, and it's going to be produced and degraded, just like that equation from Mono, right, which was like dx by dt is k minus gamma x. So here, the thing is, if you're on the bottom rung, then you have zero molecules, and you can jump up and be at one molecule or two molecules or three, all right? And you're going up and down this kind of rope ladder. You can't go underneath the floor. When you're at zero molecules, you can degrade zero. So there's no negative. The state space is the non-negative uh, integers, okay? And then in a, alongside, you know, so that's the state space. You're gonna jump up and down and that's the number of molecules. Now you have a continuous process that is running in continuous time and it's a Poisson process, which means that Poisson intervals, which are random, I snap my fingers and I get an event in which with some probability, I jump up the ladder, a new molecule has been created or with some probability a molecule has been degraded. And so that's called the constitutive model and it's represented uh, with that sort of those MT to X with production rate K, that's the up related to the probability of jumping up and gamma is the probability of jumping down. Now, this model, you imagine you turn it on, so random stuff happens, right? I mean, you, you get one molecule, zero molecules, two, three, four, it goes up and down. And the longer you run it, it just keeps moving up and down, kind of like those, uh, uh, some of those games downstairs, okay? But after a while, there's some probability that there are zero, that you're at the state of zero molecules. There's some probability that you're at the state of one molecule or two molecules or three molecules. As a matter of fact, you could have arbitrarily many molecules. Like if you're really, really lucky downstairs, you're gonna go to 10 slot machines and they're gonna hit every time. And just like in the same way here, you know, if my figures keep clicking, I mean, very unlikely, I just kept producing more and more molecules in a given interval. But that's very unlikely. And you get a distribution like that. And it's actually a theorem that that distribution is the Poisson distribution. Okay? And so in this constitutive model, you know, the idea is that, you know, RNA needs to be transcribed, but it's not, you know, a deterministic process. There's random, you know, the, there's random poly polymerase has to get involved. You have to like start the transcription with the transcription factor. All this stuff is random and that's what's driving uh, this random process, but it's biological randomness. It's not because of the assay used to measure anything. It's just how the, the thing works. Well, the, the constituent model is not the popularly accepted model. The one that is accepted and popular is called the Bursty model. And I'm just gonna tell you what it is because it's very simple. It's almost the same thing. In the Bursty model, what's, you know, the top part is just the constitutive model, but now there's an extra pair, like it's called the telegraph part, where it's either off or on. And if it's off, then nothing can be produced. You can only produce stuff when you're on. So it's kind of like an extra layer of randomness. And the motivation is the transcription factor has to bind in order to initiate the, uh, the transcription of the RNA. If there's no transcription factor, simply nothing happens. But once it's on, there's still randomness because of all the other stuff. And so it's just sort of like this extra bit of biological stochasticity because transcription is a multi-step process and, and not just you know a one-shot random process, but there's the transcription factor as the bind. It's a very simple model, but, and I don't have time to show you today, there's a lot of um, 
fluorescent and severe hybridization fish data that suggests that this is a very reasonable approximation to actually many genes in the cell. It's not perfect. And there's a lot of work over the last decade trying to put bells and whistles and improve this model and add more states and so on. But to a first order approximation, this is kind of a pretty good model for how transcription works. And here's another theorem. This one's, the, the Poisson one is not so hard. This is a bit more difficult to derive. But if you run this process, you can see on the bottom, uh, on the left bottom here is the, the telegraph. You're either on or off. So you don't get anything when you're off, but then when you're on, you, you know, you start producing stuff and degrading. Um, this model as its steady state has the negative binomial distribution. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how that theorem works. So now we have, um, now we have a sort of problem, all right? So you have the computational biologists and they log transform the data to get rid of the negative, it's the optimal transform for getting rid of all the negative binomial variation, make everything equal in variance because it's all technical in their mind. And you have the quantitative biologists, systems biologists, some of like among you, who say, no, I mean, all of this negative binomial distribution in your data, it's all biological stochasticity in the process. Of course, your data will be negative binomial. So people keep using that word noise. Uh, what does it really mean? And which of them, which, who's right and who's wrong and what do you do about this? So what we really need is a dialogue between systems biologists and computational biologists. You can't just study data science and forget that there's mechanism underneath the hood. Similarly, those, that bursty model needs to have components in it that model the technical variation in the sampling of the experiment, right? So, and you need to bridge that gap. We need to do that as a community that hasn't been done. And it's a perfect dialogue uh, for reverse engineering assessment and methods that needs to happen. So that's DREAM. Um, that's what DREAM actually stands for. And, um, and so we need, you know, we need to go in, in both directions. Well, there's a little bit of good news, some bad news and good news. The good news is that it, by chance, uh, this was already started uh, a little bit by accident um, in single cell genomics as a result of an idea called RNA velocity. And um, uh, I, I will just take a few minutes to tell you what RNA velocity is um, and why it's relevant. So, so the idea in RNA velocity was the following, that if you look at the central dogma, it's been uh, understood in much more detail over the last 50 years. In the 1970s, um, uh, it was discovered that there's a process called splicing. It was a Nobel Prize. Um, and so really the, okay, this is still simple, but the next level of complexity in which to think about transcription is that you have the transcription process generates what are called nascent molecules or unspliced molecules. And those nascent molecules are spliced or processed is also the word that's used where the introns are chopped off and you are left with processed RNA or ma mature messenger RNA. Um, and the idea is this, that if you can measure the unspliced RNA alongside the spliced RNA or the nascent together with the mature, well, then you can parameterize a model for this more complicated and more realistic view of what's going on in the cell. And in particular, because nascent molecules on timescales of a few minutes get processed into mature molecules, by measuring the nascent molecules, you get a peak at where the cell or where the gene, sorry, is going, right? So, you know, if you have a ton of nascent RNA, not so much mature RNA, you know that in a couple of minutes, that's all going to become mature. So your expression is about to go way up, even though in the moment it's not high. And vice versa, if you have a very high expression level right now, but there's not a lot of stuff in the pipe, very few nascent molecules, you know that you're about to collapse. So hence the word velocity, the idea was to use single cell genomics data to measure the number of unspliced and spliced molecules. And you can do that because when you capture the RNAs, some, sometimes you get sequences that come from introns. And so, you know, oh, this transcript still had its intron. That was an, and you inferred that was a nascent transcript. So the idea was to measure this for many genes and then 
calculate a velocity. That is like, not just where am I, but where am I going? Um, and this term was introduced in 2018, but it's actually this idea is from around 2011, I think. It was uh, developed by a scientist called Amit Zaisel, who um, had this idea in the context of microarray gene expression. For, for those of you who are a bit older, you may know what those words mean. They're kind of obsolete now, but in that context, came up with this idea of doing dynamics this way. Well, if you're, so here we are, the application motivated the work, not bridging the gap, but just, oh wait, we wanna figure out where cells are going, but now you need to write down models of what's going on in the cell and combine them with the data. So in a sense, there's no way to escape uh, walking across that dream bridge. So, okay, so this has become a very popular, uh, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't know if to use the word idea or thing that people do to their data because you can make beautiful pictures like this where you, know, you may have seen these pictures of cells and some embedding, but now you get to put arrows on the cells if you did this kind of inference so you can see where they're going. And this is kind of a picture from the, the first pa uh, this paper in 2018. These are differentiating uh, neural stem cells. And well, you can kind of just look at the picture and go, okay, those are the, stem cells and those are the differentiated cells in red and it's super cool you know you can see the differentiation happening well that's the good news the problem is that um, this kind of works but kind of doesn't work and in a recent paper that um, i've just written also with Gennady and uh, tara and michelle or my graduate students um, we we tested these methods so first of all there's two different software packages developed by two groups um, one's called Velocito and one's called SC Velo. And if you run the same data set with the two software programs, the arrows go in different directions. So, you know, that's not so good. And if you look at the literature, there's, you know, um, it turns out that there's many, many people in the literature who have noted that, like, when they run the method, well, you know, they get the wrong arrows. So sometimes, they, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And we did a very deep dive. I'll get to this in a minute. Um, you know, trying to understand like what, uh, what's going on here and like what assumptions are being made and does the modeling make sense and does the embedding make sense? How are they getting the errors? And trying to understand like how is it that when you end up reading a paper, they always kind of get a good result when, when we're benchmarking this and by the way, not just us, all these other people as well as others who have written benchmark papers, you know, you don't get good results. I think the key is actually downstairs. Um, took this picture this morning across the street, the Bellagio. But if you go to the roulette table, it's really interesting. They have, they show you the numbers that just came up on the wheel. And they show you a lot of statistics. And the question is like, why? I mean, why are they, it doesn't matter what, what just happened on the wheel. Because every time it's completely random, okay? There's no, it's not a markup process. But you see the mind operates in this way, right? You know, if it's been a lot of odd numbers, maybe, even numbers coming. Um, if it's been a lot of black, you think, ah, oh, it's the turn of white or you know, red. Um, well, it's the same way, right, with the iron velocity, right? Like in the papers, uh, they just, you know, if you, you cherry pick three or four good genes in the velocity plot, and you tweak it so the arrows are good, and the mind of the reader uh, extends, all right? But um, so I think there's some analogy there. So I'm going to play some roulette later and see if it's true. All right. Um, so, um, so that's kind of like uh, what's happening. And so, um, so what we have said about doing is um, trying to put this RNA velocity process on a rigorous footing. And I don't have time today to, and, and of course, I think my, my time is almost up. Um, so I, I don't have time to tell you everything we've done, but we have implemented um, software that can estimate parameters for these chemical mass equation models um, of the kind I've just described to you earlier. Um, you know, they have negative binomial steady state distributions, but you need to estimate the decay rates, the production rates, and so on. And these models are quite complex because unlike the bursting model, you have bursting, but you also have the splicing process and you are measuring actually two types of counts, the unspliced and the spliced, the nascent and the mature. So I don't have time to discuss it, but um, we've developed both the theory and the practice for estimating these parameters for these models under lots of assumptions that may or may not be hold, but okay, but that's the first step. 
Um, again, and this slide is truly gratuitous, but I just want to tell you that working with these chemical master equation models is very challenging. Uh, they're very time consuming. You, you have to do everything by simulation. And so it's not so simple like you just run some R script and you get out the answers. So we did a whole other project to use neural networks to, um, to figure out, to solve the models, right? So we want to know, um, given data, what are the parameters? And given parameters, what are the steady state distributions? And so to do the math, we use neural networks. And that's an interesting, generally applicable um, tool for chemical master equations. But I am just wanted to show you to, to make the point that it's actually difficult to do this. OK, so what did we learn? I'm going to go back to this conundrum and just show you what actually happened with real data. Um, this is the, also the data I showed you earlier. It comes from another project we worked on in my lab called the Brain Census. Um, uh, it's uh, part of a big consortium called the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, and it's setting out to sequence um, at single cell resolution the entire mouse brain and, uh, and then later and already started, you know, parts of the human brain. Human is hard because nobody's donating samples. Um, but, um, it, but it's a very interesting project. And then this pilot, which was a whole issue of this journal, um, uh, a very large number of people, hundreds, uh, looked at um, the primary motor cortex. And uh, th there's these kind of atlases. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't have time to show you all of this, but I wanted to just explain that this is a good data set for us to look at with regards to these fundamental questions because it's in one part of the brain. It's super deep sequencing and assaying with many different technologies so that you can um, really look at these kind of variance mean issues and understand whether they're technical or not and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, in my group, uh, my student Sina Buesagi, uh, a student at the time, he's now my postdoc, um, worked on this data. We wrote one of the papers. We looked at isoforms specifically. Um, but, and again, I won't talk about this too much, but just to say that we had uh, really our fingers deep inside this data and you know, what's going on, and we made an isoform atlas. So what we did is we took this data and we fed it through this process to look at what happens when you normalize the data. But separately, we estimated parameters from our mechanistic models, which include parameterization for technical noise um, to see what happens. And I showed you the figure on the right-hand side previously. And that's what we get in, with our modeling. So we uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the, the good news is that we meet the lower bound on biological variation. Um, of course, we don't know in this experiment how much of the variance is truly biological. We have only a bound. Right? We know at least this much is biological. Um, so don't throw it out. But, um, and, and what we've estimated to be biological um, is less than, you know, uh, so, um, uh, or I should say it the other way, the, the amount of biological variation that we see is less than the amount that we estimate, um, but there could be more. So we don't really know the right answer, but we know that we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. At the same time, this is not, you know, this is just the beginning of figuring this out because it's, there's so many assumptions in the mechanistic modeling. Um, so, you know, I, people ask me like, what should I do with my data? Should I log it or not? And my answer is, you know, probably not, but I don't really know exactly what you should do instead. You can use our model, but first of all, with current technology, we can only do this for some genes, not for all genes, um, because you have to be able to estimate these nascent clones. So, okay, so that's kind of the message. So, um, so in summary, um, uh, there's a great dream challenge here, um, or several um, for the coming years. Um, in this RNA velocity process, there's a huge number of steps. You know, you start with the data, you have to, you get reads out of these experiments, you have to align them um, to genome references or transcriptome references. You have to decide how to normalize the data or if to normalize the data. And then comes a key part and um, that's uh, on the inference box there that's in blue, you have to have a model for what's going on in the cell. 
um, it's got to be either an ordinary differential equation model, that's what some of these methods use, or a chemical master equation model. You got to benchmark and decide which is better, which makes sense, which is working. Um, then you need to make images and you have embeddings. And there's many, many ways to do that. And I, I haven't talked about that today. Um, or maybe you shouldn't make embeddings at all uh, because there's no way to embed 20,000 dimensional data in 2D. So all of this is completely wide open. And what it really needs is not more, you know, uh, another paper saying, okay, I got, I got a new method. And I, I beat this old method with some random stuff when it's so complicated and there's so many knobs. What you really need is very methodically and slowly benchmarking and assessing each one of these knobs independently of everything else to really figure out like what is the right thing to do at that granularity. And before you try to bring it all together in a big hodgepodge of stuff that ends up putting arrows in opposite directions. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you very, very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I think uh, just to repeat the question, you're asking whether we should introduce a mixture model uh, to model counts. Um, you know, in a sense, the negative binomial, it's not really a model, but the, the modeling of counts by negative binomial distribution is a hierarchical mixture model because you're, um, yeah. So in a sense, it already is. Um, yeah, I think what you need is a model. Um, you know, when, when people ask me what you really want, I mean, at the end of the day, you want a, a model that includes the bursty model and the technical sampling all in one model. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, like, right, you have the typical model, and you want to have some model, maybe like introducing some parameters to fit the model, yes. that kind of allows the state, maybe on the basis, depending on the. Oh, that's a great point. And, you know, yeah, but the, absolutely. Uh, the only thing is that, you know, uh, it's, it's tempting to add things to the models, and I'm all for it, but we're, we, despite all the hype, we actually don't have the technologies yet to make the measurements that will allow you to parameterize those models. So even the basic bursting model requires to parameterize, you know, to parameterize that requires nascent measurements alongside the spliced RNA. And even though they kind of exist, you can kind of get them say with 10 X technology, like not really and not well. And so we need more improvement on the technology side, but I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Thanks for really uh, thought provoking talk. Uh, this is a good coming from Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious because I, I know the elements, and I don't know this for the motor cortex, but at one point they actually collected a pair of data set of single nucleus RNA seeks yes. and single cell RNA seeks. And I can imagine that the two different technologies would include different proportions of some of the unspliced transcripts. So I'm curious if you could compare some of the RNA velocity techniques. Um, that, that you've developed um, in these data sets and seen any differences depending on the underlying uh, experimental technology used. So, great. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. Um, thank you. Um, yes, single nuclear RNA seq is very interesting. Um, we've actually written, uh, we've looked at it in a lot of different ways. Um, you, you might want to introduce, we, we just had a preprint come out just very recently on um, looking at delay uh, equations to, to for the purpose of like basically asking like how do you how should you model nuclear single nuclear RNA seq um, and actually our conclusion is kind of that the the models that we're using for the cytoplasmic RNA seq work well um, you know um, it, it's it's non obvious um, you know what you know what the um, so okay well, uh, I'll I'll say this. The nuclear data is very rich and excellent on the nascent transcripts, but unfortunately it's not, regi you, you'd like to register the measurements in the same cell, right? That's kind of the problem. Um, and so but the nuclear is of course lacking of the mature transcripts. So 
One's here, one's there. Um, but I will say that, and we're writing about this now in a paper, um, one of the challenges with nuclear RNA seq it's actually very interesting, is people realize that all the reads map to the introns, and so they collect these. You, they have to get a count matrix, and nobody knows. Like, do you add the counts from the exons and the introns, or do you? And and this approach that I, you know, posited today, it actually answers the question: how to integrate those data, right? Because you make one model and you estimate the parameters. So, excellent question. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. So, another question about that data set: you talked about how you're finding these why these different things. So the mechanisms underlying these differences between the cell ticks. And what I was wondering is if you try RNA velocity or some of the previous other previous methods, does the final biological story end up being different in terms of what is the cell ick? Is it striking profile? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know how to answer your question. It's a very good question. Um, uh, one of the things about, you know, so when you have a method like R, when, so RNA velocity, you know, it's not really a method. It's, it's, it's a protocol that isn't even explicit, and it's many protocols because there's lots of variations of it. And when you have something that's complicated, it's the way it usually works is you start with the story, and then you fit the method to the story. Um, but then if you get other parameters, then it doesn't match the story. But then you go, okay, but these are wrong because they don't match the story. So you know, to really answer your question, you have to be in a setting where, uh, yeah, where you, you kind of don't know the story. I mean, there's a recent uh, actual article. Um, th there were two recent high profile papers on synthetic embryos. It's a whole thing where they're trying to make um, synthetic embryos. And in one of them, um, actually in that paper itself, they have two pictures with arrows going in the opposite directions. And the authors sort of just, uh, yeah, they say, they, they, write, they explain it as like, that, that, that's just fine. But uh, I don't know like what to say about that, you know, it's, it's not fine. So I don't, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, we need to do more controls and be very careful. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. I mean, I, don't, I haven't thought about whether quantum computing is a good modality for solving some of these chemical mass equations. I don't know. I, mean, I will say that um, you know, I've, I've had over the years a fairly interdisciplinary group at all times, and I've worked with several physicists. But right now, in my group, there are several physicists, and there's lots of um, it, you, there's lots of inspiration to be had from um, models such as the icing model and other things like that. Uh, that's certainly coming up. But I haven't thought about your question. I don't know the answer, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great talk. And then my name is Rodrigo. But yeah, I just have a short question to you. The first one I have to you is when you are mentioning about the specificity and the RV people, I don't know if you are mentioning about the RV people, actually, it's the main condition for me that the vaccine was processed to actually also talk to the OB. So I'm just using the two of the vaccine that are also going to be using one cell that is not taking the vaccine to do the OB simulation. That's one. And then the second one is uh, I'm also curious about the uh, animal therapy because uh, when you, I, I'm not aware of the data solver, but I'm just thinking like when you say that the uh, R-plus is flat and then there's a PCR application in the race and so on so forth, then how do we control for the, that kind of technical model? Because if we see, just see the reads, we can also extract this kind of uh, uh, application or anything, I'm not sure. And then the third one is uh, more general. I'm just curious about like, uh, we know that uh, I mean, I'm doing that this kind of programming uh, system for every approach is interesting, but for many of the analytic data or some or similar kind of analytic data, usually it's not time sensitive. So, is it uh, any other like, way we can do some kind of interesting measure with the analytic data? 
Okay, those are great questions. Uh, you know, on the, on the, I'll go in reverse order. On the last question, yeah, you know, there are metabolic labeling experiments and there are also, like nowadays, people are doing series in embryos. Um, so there are time series data and there are ways. Um, and of course, I'm suggesting that, not me, but in the iron velocity um, paradigm, the idea is that even in a static experiment, there's information about dynamics. So, uh, but yeah, it's a good question, but there are other data sets and more and more are emerging, but of course there's a need for, for many more than that. Um, your second question uh, was referred to RNA velocity, I think. Um, can you remind me what it was again? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, uh, because you're saying that uh, we just need a reason and there is a reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I remember now. Yeah, so on the technical aspect of that, yeah, that's a real big issue. Um, we have actually recently, uh, we, have a, we have a paper about, so, you know, the longer the introns are, the more you expect to measure from them, for example. So, yeah, you need to account for biases in that, uh, and that's important. Um, and on the first question, yeah, I, I, that's a good question, but I don't really know the answer. We haven't really looked at that uh, uh, issue about the means. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you.